I want to declare this healing. I felt the Lord showed me a couple of things that he wants to heal today. And uh, if this is you, just receive it by faith. But specifically, number one was sore throat, that he wants to heal sore throats. If that's you, could you just do like this? And we call you healed in the name of Jesus, wherever you are online, wherever you are, irregular heartbeat, do like this. We call you healed right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we call your heartbeat healed in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord, where there's been a memory loss for whatever reason, um, like I'm forgetting stuff, we call you healed right now in the name of Jesus. Um, seizures, um, not very regularly, but every once in a while, we call you healed right now in Jesus' name. And Lord, we just thank you, even Achilles, uh, maybe there's been an Achilles rupture, tear, or sprain. We call you healed right now in the name of Jesus. And God, we just thank you for the power of your presence that is in this place. Amen? Amen. If you have a Bible, go with me over to John chapter number 4. We've been looking at the Samaritan woman, also known as the woman by the well. Today, I'm actually going to read out of the Message Bible, okay? Because many times I love to look at different translations because it kind of makes God's word to me more clear. The NIV, the ESV, um, the uh, Message Bible, the uh, New Living Translation. And today I want to look at the Message Bible. So read this with me in John chapter 4, verse 27. Just then his disciples came back and they were shocked. They couldn't believe that he was talking with this kind of woman. No one said what were he, was he talking about, but their faces showed it. The woman took the hint and she left. And in her confusion, she left her water pot. Back in the villages, she told the people, come see a man who knew all about the things that I did, who knows me inside and out. Do you think that this could be the Messiah? And they went out to see for themselves. In the meantime, the disciples pressed him. they like, Rabbi, you need to eat something. Aren't you going to eat? And he told them, I love this part, I got food to eat that you know nothing about. And the disciples, they were puzzled. they like, what is this brother talking about? Who could have brought him any food? And Jesus said, the food, watch this, that keeps me going is that I do the will of the one who sent me, finishing the work he started. We are continuing in our series. This is actually part 11 today of a series that we've been on called Change the World. Everybody say Change the World. I want today not to be a teaching for you, but I also want it to be an impartation of faith because whether you believe it or not, no matter who you are and what you've been through, God has called you to this place to be equipped to go out and change your world. The world is in need of changing. We are the ambassadors of Christ that represent the kingdom of heaven and the earth. And today's message is vital for you to get hold of. Somebody shout, it's vital. vital. And today's message is called the secret to spiritual growth, the secret of spiritual growth. And here's the principle that I want you to embrace today is that you're fed by feeding. Somebody say it with me, I'm fed by feeding. And when I say the secret of spiritual growth, I don't want you to hear it like Illuminati secret or like, shh, nobody knows it secret. I want you to hear it like, this is something that the average Christian just doesn't acknowledge. They just does, they don't get it. So it's a secret because even though it's obvious, so many people just miss it altogether. Now, does anybody here want to grow spiritually in 2022? Let me see by a show of hands if that's you. Are you serious about that? And so I want to give you some keys to spiritual growth. Um, how many of you all want 2022 to be your best year ever? Let me see by a show of hands. You want 2022 to be your best year ever? But unfortunately, um, many people think that 2022 will be their best year ever if they maybe get a new boo. Is that you? You feel like if I finally get me a man, if I finally get me somebody to love, then it's going to be my best year ever. And I really don't know if that's true or not. You might feel good, but truthfully, if you're waiting on somebody to make you happy, then you're going to be waiting a long time. Some people might say, well, I need to make six figures. This will be my best year ever if I make six figures. And a lot of people think that. If I could just get that promotion, if I could just make a little bit more money, I know that 2022 is going to be my best year ever if I can just get the promotion. But there's a lot of people who have more money, but they don't have more joy and they don't have more peace. I know there's somebody who's watching this that says, man, 2022 is going to be my best year ever if I can do what? get out of debt, if I could just get out of debt, if I could just save a little bit more, if I could just pay off that credit card, pay off that home loan, pay off that car, then 2022 will be my best year ever.
but I don't know if that's true or not. Then there's some people who says, 2022 is going to be my best year ever if I lose 50 pounds. And if you need to lose 50 pounds, <laughs> it's going to be a good year for you. If you, you might sleep a little bit better. Come on, somebody. Your clothes might fit a little bit better. You might feel a little bit more confident about who you are, but I don't think that's necessarily going to mean that it's going to be your best year ever. I know there's some people here, they say, man, when I finally finish school, yeah, I know you're here. I finally don't have final exams. I finally don't, I don't have no more homework. This is going to be my best year ever when I finish school until you finish school and can't get a job yet. And then maybe it's amazing how we, we think that these are the things that are going to make us have the best year ever. But I got another one to submit to you today. If you're here today and you're like, how is 2022 going to be my best year ever? It's going to be your best year ever if it's your best year spiritually. And this is a divine revelation for somebody in the house today. Because you can pay off debt, you can get your boo, you can get a new car, you can get a new home. But if you don't have a better relationship with Jesus, everything else that you want in your life is going to flow after you making the main thing the main thing. Meaning that if you put God first, everything else is going to be added unto you. And if this is your best year spiritually, this will be the best year you've ever had. I'm preaching better than you saying amen today. See, this year, 2021, was my best year ever. And we built a building. My mom is overcoming cancer, and my wife beat cancer's tail. Come on, somebody. And it wasn't my best year ever because I had everything I wanted when I wanted it. It was my best year ever because it's been my best year spiritually. I think more like Jesus. I embrace more like Jesus. I love more like Jesus. Say this with me. This will be my best year ever if it's my best year spiritually. Now, if you want this to be your best year spiritually, and I know y'all got goals and everything, and I believe our number one goal should be to be more like Jesus, to think like Jesus, to act like Jesus, to love like Jesus. But to accomplish any goal, and I know you got goals for next year, there has to be um, parameters and disciplines. Because if you have a goal without disciplines, it's nothing more than a hoop dream. It sounds good on paper, but you ain't never going to see it come to pass. You can say all you want that you're going to lose weight this year and be more healthy, but if you don't stay out of Krispy Kreme, if you don't start working out, if you don't start having portion control and knowing how to say no to, come on somebody. So it's a goal, but do you have daily disciplines to accomplish the goal? You can say, I want to get out of debt this year, but if you keep spending at the rate that you've been spending and you got to have every new phone that comes out and you don't know how to say no to something today so that you can say yes to something tomorrow, a goal without parameters and disciplines is nothing but a hoop dream. And you can say, this is the year that I want to grow spiritually, and that's a goal, but without daily disciplines, it's nothing but a hoop dream. So I want to give you a few disciplines that you need. Now, let me make sure y'all the right class. How many of you all want to grow spiritually in 2000? Y'all still with me? Uh, let me make sure I got Okay. All right. Here's a few disciplines that you need. Number one, write this down. You need daily time with God. Mm. You just need daily time with God. Daily time with God. I know some of you are like, oh, no, I just ain't studied my Bible yet. I was at church last Sunday. No, I'm talking about daily time with God. And so we do a thing here called the first 15, everybody say the first 15, where we encourage you to have five minutes in the word, five minutes of worship, five minutes of prayer at least every day. That means I'm going to get on YouTube, I'm going to turn on one worship song, lift my hands. I'm going to get on my knees or something, I'm going to pray to God at least five minutes. I'm going to get a scripture and I'm going to meditate on it, see how I can apply it to my life, go through my acts, 15 minutes. Now some of y'all, you know, you're advanced, do 30 minutes, do 60 minutes, but everybody got 15 minutes. This is a necessity. I'm talking about like the need that you have for water, the need that you have to eat. You have to eat the Word of God. If you want a relationship with God, you can't just visit your communication and your time with Him. Just like I wouldn't have a good relationship with my wife if we didn't talk but once a year or when I needed something from her. Number two, the second discipline that you need, please write this down, is godly relationships. If you show me your friends, I can prophesy your future because you will become like who you hang out with. And one of the easiest ways to change your life is to change your friends. If you hang out with other people that are questionable in their belief and doing whatever, that's gonna come off on you, okay? 
And so I'm not saying that you got to go and get rid of your friends, but you need to know who should be in your inner circle. Because who you let in your inner circle affects your inner ear. See, there's two ears that you have, the outer ear where you're hearing this message today, but you have the inner ear where you hear the voice of God. And it's something about the friends that you have in the inner circle, they influence your inner ear and how you even hear from God. And if you ever want to take your life to another level, you got to take your relationships to another level and get some people in your life that are ride and die for Jesus. Get some people in your life that will fast and pray with you when you're going through something. Get some people in your life that don't compromise but have deep convictions. Come on, somebody. My pastor used to say it like this. He would say, hang with those who have your answers and get away from those who have your problems. This is a year for you to identify. I'm talking about even your family. Sometimes your family, your ride or die from the fourth grade, you gotta say, I'm gonna love you from a distance because you're toxic. But the third parameter is the one that I want you to get hold of. If you say, this is my year, 2022, I don't care what happens in the land, I don't care what happens in the economy, for me and Jesus, we gonna go there this year. If that's you, you got to get hold of this parameter. Number three is this. If you want to grow spiritually, you got to help other people grow spiritually. This is the parameter to spiritual growth. You, you, you will only grow to the level that you help other people grow. The principle is this, is that you're fed by feeding. Say it with me. I'm fed by feeding. Not just by eating and not just by reading, you are fed by Feeding. I need you to hear this today because some of you think that you are fed by eating and it's like I want to grow spiritually So let me go to another small group and another Bible study and go to seminary But you still come out and you don't know how to submit you don't know how to have long-suffering You don't know how to have patience You don't know how to deal with ungodly people and turn the other cheek You got head knowledge that you don't know how to live out because spiritual growth is not just about you eating and reading It's actually about you feeding. It's about you taking what you're getting and giving it to somebody else It's about you finding somebody else that ain't on fire, but helping the fire blow the wind of God on them so they can get on fire and you're not fed by eating or reading you're actually fed by feeding this is a secret I see so many people miss it and I, I'm oh my god listen I'm I've been a pastor it'll be 15 years in April man time flies it's been crazy Joshua and I've preached around the nation and I've been to so many churches so this comment is not just about this church I've been around the world before the pandemic preaching. I've been to church after church after church. Don't matter in India, wherever, Africa, Australia, wherever we go, you hear this same comment. Same comment from God's precious people. I want to help somebody today. Maybe you're online. I need to help you today. This is the comment that I hear. But I just feel like I'm not growing no more in this church. And the problem is, is that you think your church is responsible for your spiritual growth. And I got an announcement to make. I don't know who this is for today, but I need to help you either right now or somebody that you know or for a future mistake that you will make that your church is going to aid you and help you, but you are the one that's responsible for your spiritual growth. Stop blaming it on anybody else. Come on, somebody. You don't need another class. You don't need another small group. You need to take what you learned and go to a prison or an orphanage and help somebody else. Doggone grow in their faith. I'm telling you the truth today. Because you are fed by feeding. It's the same thing. I feel like I'm not growing spiritually. So it's almost like you think that the organization of the church is supposed to grow you, and they're supposed to be the ones responsible, but that's like you saying, my wife is supposed to grow me spiritually. My husband is supposed to grow me spiritually. Kids saying, well, my parents are supposed to grow me. No, you're supposed to grow you spiritually. Just think about it. If you were in the military and you had no church around, and you're taking a stint in Afghanistan or somewhere, maybe they don't have chapel, and you could not get to church, you're still supposed to grow spiritually, like without the the church. I'm talking about if you're in prison, and they don't have chapel, and you're just in a cell, but you got a Bible, you still should be growing spiritually without church. God, I wish you'd hear me today. If you were a missionary, and you were out in the Amazon, or you were out in the jungle somewhere, and you couldn't get to a steeple, you couldn't get to a building, with TVs and stuff, you couldn't do that, we would still expect you to grow spiritually. Okay, if you ever become a lead pastor and you have your own church and you got to come every single Sunday, every single month, year after year, decade after decade, and you never sit under the Word, 
Because that's what people think. Well, I just need a season to sit under the word. What do you mean? You need a season to be in the flesh? Nobody needs that season. You need a season. It's not sitting under the word. It's sitting under the word and living out the word. It's sitting under the word and living out the word. It's sitting under the word and living out the word. It's not sitting under the word just so I can get myself together. No, help somebody else get themselves together as you get somebody else together. This is a secret for spiritual growth. Think about me for a moment. I've been a pastor for 14 years. I never sit under the word. Sometimes I'll sit under Pastor Josh. Sometimes I'll sit under Pastor Aaron. Sometimes in 14 years, I'll be able to go to a pastor's conference. But day after day, year after year, decade after decade, I come and I give you the word. But I'm growing spiritually right now more than I ever have because I'm fed by feeding, not fed by eating, and not fed by just reading. And so because I'm helping more people grow spiritually, now I'm growing more spiritually. Are y'all hearing me today? I'm just trying to help somebody today. Because people thought it was this, but actually it's that. And we need to make sure that we get it right today. Would the church please say amen? amen. That's what John 4 is talking about. The disciples of Jesus are amazed. They are starving and they're looking for food. They come back to Jesus, and he acts like he's already eaten. <laughs> They're like, did somebody bring him some food? He's like, I got food that you don't know nothing about. And he teaches us, Joshua, one of the greatest revelations of John 4. There's so much that we've looked at in John chapter 4, but this might be the greatest principle. John chapter 4, watch this in the Message Bible translation. The food that keeps me going is to do the will of him who sent me and finish the work he started. Look in the NKJV version. He says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Let's look at the last translation you have there, the Amplify. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to completely finish the work. In essence, he is saying, I find fulfillment not just by natural things, but spiritual things. I grow by helping other people grow. What Jesus is saying is that I'm actually fed, not by chicken steak. <laughs> I'm fed by feeding other people. You will be fed by doing the work, doing what Jesus has called you to do with the church. Say amen. So the next question for us should be, well, what has God called us to do? And this really is for everybody who's here. I know some of you all, this is your first time in church, but you're not here by an accident. We all have a precious call of God on our life. And I believe that when we step into it, we step into fulfillment. We step into a purpose that's eternal. And this is what God has called us to do. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. ready. Watch this, Mark chapter number 16, verse number 15. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He wasn't just talking to his disciples then. He's talking to his disciples now. That's us. And I love it that this is not a suggestion. This is actually a command. Keep it up on the board. Go into all the world. Don't just tell people to come. You first got to go for them to ever come. Go into all the world. How do you change the world? You change it by changing your world, your sphere of influence. And it says, go to them and preach to them the gospel. You know, it's almost a negative thing now. I don't, I don't want nobody preaching to me. No, some people need to be preached to. You have to preach that they are sinners and there's a savior that got on a cross and it's good news to accept him to receive eternal salvation. So Mark 16, keep it up for me. It says, go into the world and preach the gospel to all creation. I love it that there's no prejudice in all creation. I love it that there's no sexism in all creation. I love it that he gives us an assignment to go to preach to people that you might not even want to deal with or talk to. But the gospel loves to break down the barriers that the devil has caused humanity to accept as norm. Some of you guys are great at preaching the gospel to poor people. I'm talking about if we ever do feeding here, you're like, you bout it, but you don't really like rich people. But the Bible says preach it to all creation. Some of y'all are great at preaching the gospel to black people. 
You're great at preaching it to white people or other Hispanics because that's what you are. But it didn't say just go and preach the gospel to your people group. It says go preach the gospel to everybody who's breathing. The people that you work with, the people that you don't like. Come on, somebody. The gays, the straights, the have, the have-nots, the sinners, the saints. It says go preach this good news to everybody that would listen to you. And we can't be selective concerning who we love. That's what we're commanded to do, and we're fed by feeding. Watch this one here. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. How many of y'all want to be more like Jesus? Come on, that's your goal. Anybody here, you want to be more like Jesus? Watch what Jesus did. Luke 19 and 10, it says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save that which is lost. That's why he came. I don't know what your goals are for 2022, but I believe on the top of your goals should be this year, I want to be like Jesus. I want to love like Jesus. I want to have grace like Jesus. I want to forgive like Jesus. I want to walk in power like Jesus walked in. All right, I want to be more like Jesus. How many of y'all want to be more like Jesus? Online, if that's you, put it in the chat. You want to be like Jesus. You can't be like Jesus if you don't seek and save the lost. You cannot be like Jesus if you do not seek and save the lost. Lost people aren't falling into your lap like, I want to be saved today. That ain't going to happen at work. You got to go to them, take them to lunch, be kind. You got to figure out how to do this thing. Come on, you got to pray with them until every wall in their heart begins to fall down. You got to be, no, you got to notice them. You got to be on your toes. And if you want to be like Jesus, you cannot just be saved for you. You, you are saved not just for yourself. You're saved so that you can go and get somebody else saved. You're delivered so you can get somebody else delivered. You're healed so that you can go get somebody else healed. Are y'all with me today? What does the Bible tell us to do? 2 Corinthians 5.18. It says, now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ Jesus. And he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. Would you, would you please push somebody around you? Just say, you've been given ministry. You, come on, push somebody. Say, you've been called. Get somebody else. Say, you've been called into the ministry. No, no, no. Get them. Tell them that you've been called because some people don't know. They think I'm called. You think, so, okay, y'all look this way. Y'all ain't, ain't playing fair today. Y'all, some of you all think that you got to have the bishop, the pastor, the reverend behind your name to do ministry. You somehow think that ministry is for the people on the platform or for the holy people. No, the ministry has been given to every single person that's accepted Jesus. You have a ministry. Come on, somebody shout, I have a ministry. No, shout like you believe it, I have a ministry. And there is an anointing on your ministry, and you will not be fulfilled without fulfilling the ministry that God has given you. And keep it on the board if you don't mind. And so he has given us, somebody shout us, the ministry of reconciliation. Mm -mm -mm. And so what does the word reconcile mean? I'm glad you asked. It means bringing again into unity, harmony or agreement, what has been alienated. (laughs) Bringing into unity, harmony or agreement, what has been alienated. Keep that definition up. Because of our sin and the holiness of God, we have been alienated from God. God is over there. Humanity is over here. Jesus becomes the bridge to bring a holy God and a sinful... Look at my arms, the cross. See, it's the holy God. He bring, he's the bridge. He's the bridge. What does he do? He reconciles a holy God back into fellowship with a sinful man. But then Jesus is no longer preaching the gospel. He's given us the ministry of reconciliation. So Jesus was the reconciler, but now he calls Jesus' followers to be the ministers of reconciliation. That if you want to see this, Jesus is by the right hand of the Father praying we don't mess it up. Because he said, I've given you the authority now to go into the world and preach the gospel to reconcile the world. And so you have to accept that I'm a minister, and I've been given a ministry, and there's an anointing for me to get it done. Would the church please say amen? Amen. What does the Bible call us to do? What is the work? Are y'all with me today? I ain't preaching just to preach good messages. I'm preaching so we can live this thing out. Amen, Amen, somebody. Romans chapter 10, verse 14, it says, how then were they calling him who they've not believed? How can they call? Okay, so how many of y'all have unsaved coworkers, family members, friends? 
How can they call on Jesus? Keep the, keep the scripture on the lower thirds if you don't mind. If they've not believed. And so first they got to believe. But how can they believe if they've never heard? And that's why the devil wants you to shut up. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And how can they hear without somebody preaching? Somebody that's just bold enough to accept this ministry. How could they ever hear without somebody opening up their mouth and heralding the good news and sharing their testimony? And I love this part because it all adds up. There has to be a preacher in order for somebody to hear, and they have to hear in order for them to believe, and they got to believe before they ever call on the name of the Lord, and they got to call on the name of the Lord before they're ever saved, and they got to be saved so they don't go to hell, but they go to heaven. And I think it's time for us to stop holding back the word hell. It's not like Jesus was scared to talk about hell because he knew it was a real place. It's almost like we've become so watered down that we don't want to offend people by telling them that there is a spiritual reality. When your spirit leaves your body, it ain't floating around somewhere. It's going to heaven or hell depending upon what you did with Jesus. And if the gospel is not quiet about hell, I'm not going to be quiet about it. It is not just a state of mind. It's the place where God's not. So if you reject the Savior, you go to the one place where there's no light, there's no health, there's no peace because that's everything Jehovah is. He allows you to go to the place that you want. And how will they know? I'm sorry. And how will they preach? <laughs> Unless they're sent. And I believe what God is calling us to do today is to be the sent ones. Are y'all with me? We are a sent church with sent people. I see this. And God is sending us. Oh, God is sending us to the job you got just wasn't for you to make money. He's put you there as an ambassador. He is sending you to the university. Don't let them change you. You're there to change them. He has sent you to the Fortune 500 companies. He is sending you into the neighborhoods, to the highways and byways. You are sent by God Almighty to change this world. Somebody shout this, I'm a sent one. Do y'all believe that today? I got one more for you and we'll be done. First Peter 3 and 15. What does the Bible tell us to do? It says, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason, for the hope that is in you. And then it gives us a posture. It says, do it with gentleness and respect. You ever seen people online, like debating with each other over the Bible, and they're getting angry? Stay out of that. Because we are to have a spirit of gentleness and respect. Even when you don't like certain churches or certain preachers, don't put your mouth on them. We do everything we do with gentleness and respect. It's amazing the people who try to expose the people that they never pray for. I love it that the Bible gives us hints. It says, always be prepared to make a defense to anybody who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. There's an assumption that you live out loud so well that unsaved people start to ask you questions about your faith. Meaning that all hell could be breaking out around us, but you still got joy. And the people that don't even know Jesus look at you and say, how do you have joy with all that's happening in the world? You lose somebody that's close to you. There's a pandemic that we go through. I don't know what the church scored on the heavenly scorecard during the pandemic, but I don't think it was an A. I think most of us walk by fear just like the world did. But there should be something that's so bold and authentic and loving and filled with faith in times of uncertainty. People that don't even know Jesus say, how are you not troubled? You got laid off, but still you got peace. You went through the divorce, but still you have joy. You went through hell and back, but still you trust in God. And you live out your life in a way that people ask you about the hope. Who are y'all hearing me today? But I think that a key is found in the first part. It says, but in your hearts, honor Christ as the Lord is holy. And it says, always be prepared. Somebody say, always be prepared. And if I was to be honest with you, there's sometimes I ain't prepared to talk to people about Jesus. I just not. Like, I'm that guy. Like, I'm an introvert. I know you think I'm different. I'm a, I'm a closet introvert acting like an extrovert. 
So you know how some people, they get to the party and they get energy? Oh, I get energy being by myself. Like no kids, no wife, headphones, book. That's me. I love. But see, some of you guys are allowing your personality to dictate your purpose, and you got to flip it. You say, how do you do what you do? Because I will not be in bondage to my personality and my Enneagram. I'm only here to serve the Lord, and whatever he calls me to do, that's what I do. Are y'all here with me today? But the Bible says to be prepared. Please write this down, because you got to be prepared. I'm just not prepared. I'm that guy that, like, sometimes when I go to the grocery store, I'm not prepared to share my faith with somebody. I'm, like, trying to go get what I want to get with sunglasses on and a hat and a hoodie, like, like I'm famous or something, and I ain't even famous. I'm just like, leave me alone. Don't even talk to me. Don't even wave at me. That would be my natural thing to do, even though I don't do that all the time. Even when people come to my house, y'all have like Amazon drivers and, and UPS and FedEx. It's like people stop at my house now, like every 30 minutes. I'm like, oh, my God, toilet paper showing up. Oh, my God, a shift. They're delivering groceries. It's like, every, and, and I'm the kind of person that, like, I'm like, oh, my God, who's at the door now? And this is a true story. I, I can't even make this up. Listen. I was studying this at 3.30 on Wednesday, and I'm sitting on my couch in the living room, and I read this scripture about being prepared. In my mind, I think, man, I'm going to preach this. I'm going to tell God's people they need to be prepared to share their faith all the time. Wherever you go, just be prepared. I'm sitting on the couch, hear a ring at the doorbell. Ding dong. I thought it was somebody just going to drop something off. He just stays there for a minute. It's a salesperson trying to sell some windows. And um, I'm sitting on the couch and studying. And I said, Kenny, my son, 10 years old, I said, he's running around. I said, go get the door. And he goes up all happy. <laughs> he opens the door, and the guy says, hey, you know, this is who I am. Um, is your parents home? And he goes, oh, yeah, he's right here sitting on the couch. <laughs> I'm telling you, I was so disgusted with this dude. I'm like, you 10 years old, lie to this man. Tell him he ain't home. Tell him he don't want none. Come on, you can do a better job than that. <laughs> so I got an attitude this is a true story I got an attitude so I get up I'm like man I don't want none what you selling man I'm trying to study for prepare for the Lord's people and listen I come to the door I open up the door like this there's a young man he says oh my god are you the YouTube preacher he says, I'm from Connecticut. My family watches you all the time. He says, oh, my God. No lie. He says, I'm tongue-tied. I can't even tell you. Oh, my God. I'm like starstruck. And so then I'm like, yeah, it's me. Praise God. <laughs> How can I help you today? <laughs> Whatever you're selling, I'm buying. You know, whatever, you know. <laughs> and I stood there for five minutes, and I let this man give me his sales pitch. And as he's talking... Socially distant. I'm laughing. And I know, young man, if you're watching now, I wasn't laughing at you. I was laughing because of the humor of the Lord. That I would be preparing a message to come and to preach you about being prepared. And I was completely unprepared for the people that he would send into my sphere of influence. And I'm just, uh, I'm like, oh, I don't believe this one, Jesus. You got a sense of humor, you do. I'm just laughing the whole time, right? And it's amazing that God was teaching me a lesson to stay prepared because you're not fed by what you're reading, son. You're fed by staying on your toes to give people the word of God that I've deposited it in you. And somebody needs to hear today that people are not a problem. Come on, somebody. They are a pleasure. They are not a problem to be put off, and you don't want to deal with them. They have been made in the image and likeness of God. And thank God that God sent somebody to help your crazy tail when you was out there acting wild. And how dare we get saved and then we shut down. And I come and I told Tabitha that. She said, that's a word for me because <laughs> I don't like anybody coming to the door. You just got to stay prepared. Yeah. <laughs> so here's some things that I believe God wants us to know today for the sake of note taking. Um, sharing your faith is not just for mature believers. Not too long ago, I had a guy when I first started this series on Change the World, I'm fired up. I'm like, man, we're about to change the world. We're going to have soul winners. People going to be evangelizing their faith. Let's go. And I preached my heart out like the first message. 
And I asked this guy, I said, hey, how was it? I thought he was going to be like, bro, let's go do this. He was like, I just didn't feel like that word was for me. And I was like, what you say? <laughs> he said, I just didn't feel like that word was for me. Now, looking back on it, it was because he was coming out of a really dark place in his life. And he had been out of church for a while. And so he thought he was going to come and hear something to meet his need, not to hear something to go meet somebody else's need. And he didn't realize that he actually heard the answer that he needed. The answer of how to get out of a dark place is to help somebody out of theirs. And some of you all discounted like this is too mature for you. No, this is for you. You get saved yesterday, start sharing your faith today. This is what I believe God wants us to know. Sharing your faith is not just for the people who seem like they have it all together. Because the Bible is infamous with using ratchet people. God used Paul even though he persecuted the church. God used Moses even though he was a murderer. God used David even though he was an adulterer. God used Rahab even though she was a prostitute. I would say ho, but I don't think you can handle that. God used Jacob because he was a trickster. God used a Samaritan woman who had five husbands and now was shacking with the six. Sure enough, God can use you. I'm not saying that holiness is not important. But I'm saying that God loves to use people with the past. I believe God wants us to know today that sharing your faith is not just for the extrovert or the party thrower. I'm an introvert with extrovert qualities. And I believe you have to come to the place where you realize that this is not about your personality. It is about your purpose. I believe God wants us to know today that you become better at sharing your faith the more you share it. Just like a quarterback gets better, the more reps that he has. You know, if you have a rookie quarterback, if you, and this is football for those of us who are in America, um, the rookie year, you don't expect too much of this guy. You know, you want him to develop by the second or third year. Hopefully, he's not throwing so many interceptions because he gets better the more he throws, like preaching. You don't just jump up and preach and it's like the best thing ever. You get better the more you do it. That's why you got to give a lot of grace to new people that hit the stage. I remember my first time preaching, my mouth was so dry that my tongue was stuck to the roof of my mouth in a way that I'd never experienced. I mean, it was like I couldn't talk. So they were bringing me water, and they brought it in a glass with ice in it. And so the whole time I'm drinking water and the recording, all you could hear was the glass and the ice in the glass. It was amazing how bad it was. And I don't have that problem as much anymore because the more you do it, the easier that it gets. When you start sharing your faith with people, you are gonna say stuff that's doctrinally incorrect. You are gonna sweat and have hot flashes. You are going to offend people, but don't stop sharing because you get better the more you share it. See, the devil loves for us to have a fail and so you meet somebody that comes with some deep stuff. They've been studying the Bible for years to try to convince you why your faith is wrong and you meet that person the first time you're trying to share your faith and you're like, man, I suck. I ain't never doing that again. No, 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 no. You got to go and share it again the next day and share it again the next day because the more you do it, the better that you get. I believe God wants us to know that today. And I also believe that God wants us to know is that you grow spiritually by helping other people grow spiritually. Simple, all right? One of the hardest parts about being a pastor is that every week Sundays are coming. And every week I got to prepare this meal to feed you on Sundays. The hardest part about being a pastor is that I don't really get a lot of time off. Even if I'm not here, I'm probably at another church Every single Sunday, year after year, decade after decade, same bat time, same bat channel. I got to do the same thing over and over. It's one of the worst parts about being a pastor. But one of the best parts about being a pastor is that day by day, week by week, Sunday by Sunday, I got to stay on my toes so that I can feed you. Meaning that the hardest thing is actually the best thing because I can't have a fight with Tabitha on Saturday night and come here before you and feel good about it. I got to get it together. Oh, baby, wake up. We got to get this thing right because Sunday's coming and I need to make sure that I'm fresh before people. See, so the worst thing about leading a marriage group is that every week the people are coming. 
for 13 weeks. And you're thinking to yourself, like, why did I sign up for this? Oh, my God. Like, they're coming to my house again, and they got their problems again, and I got to tell them again about having a family meeting. But the best thing about leading a marriage group is that every week the people are coming, and they got their same problems again, and you got to go study to feed them again, and you got to stay on your toes to help somebody else again. And it's amazing how helping other people's marriage actually helps yours. <laughs> the worst part about leading a financial group is that it comes every week. The best part is that it comes every week. So you got to help somebody else with their budget and it reminds you of yours. you got to help somebody else live beneath their means so it reminds you of what you're supposed to do. So when you help other people grow spiritually, God uses it to help you grow spiritually. If you want to stay on fire for God, help other people stay on fire for God. Week after week, day after day, when you feel like it and when you don't feel like it. I don't know about you, but I will be in this pulpit and I will be preaching with my heart out. You come five years, ten years, if I'm still in this earth, I will be doing the exact same thing because I'm not fed by eating, fed by reading. I am fed by feeding. This keeps me tight for you. And the thing that you haven't want to do, you don't want to do it because I ain't got time for that right now. I got that. It's actually the thing that you need. Some of you, you need to invite your crazy uncle to church with you. You need to feel what it feels like for him to reject you five years, but come on the six years and get filled with the Holy Ghost and pray in other tongues. You say, oh my God, I gave up on you like three years ago, but look at the grace of God. Some of y'all need to invite your boss. You're like, my, my boss ain't spiritual. But you need to know what it feels like to stand in front of the church and they 10 minutes late, but you got them a seat saved. You need to know what it feels like to bring your relatives to church. And when I give the appeal to lift your hand, you kind of peeking out the side of your eye like, Jesus, please let them lift their hand. You need to know what it's like to be rejected and persecuted, but then see your family members come around and just say, thank you for not giving up on me. So you grow by helping people grow spiritually. Don't you dare give up because one waters, one plants, but it's God that gives the increase whenever he wants to give it. And he uses us. And how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of good tidings. Come on, church. Let's get ready to change the world. For the sake of not going on and on because I could, I think I better stop right there. Are you guys getting this today? So what's the secret of spiritual growth? Is that helping other people grow spiritually, it helps you grow spiritually. This is the secret, that you're fed by feeding. All right? You're fed by feeding. I want to pray for you guys. I love you guys. I'm having a lot of fun seeing what God's doing in our church. I want to release a mantle of evangelism that I just want you to receive it by faith. And from this day forward, I want you to look at yourself as the answer to the problems in your family and the answer to the problems that are in our nation. Even though people not, might not acknowledge it yet, you have something that they need. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, I lift up every person that is online, every person that's in our sanctuaries today, and I pray that the spirit of evangelism fall on them. Let it be in their heart that they will know from this day forward that they are an ambassador of Christ. They are a sent one. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of Jesus. And I pray that from this day forward, we will go out into the highways and byways and compel people to come. I pray for supernatural grace. I pray for wisdom. I pray for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. All nine spiritual gifts, 1 Corinthians 12. I thank you that you divide them severally as you will, and you let them flow, not just in the church, but outside the church. I thank you that now is a time for great revival. I also pray that open heaven is here and open heaven is now. I thank you that the shackles and the years of generational curses are being broken, even in the sanctuary right now. As you replace wrong thoughts with right thoughts, wrong ideology with kingdom perspective, I pray, God, right now, that like rivers of living water will begin to flow out of our mouths, that we will be in this world but not of it, that we'll be wise as a, a serpent but harmless as a dove, that you will put us in positions of prominence and influence, not for our glory, but to glorify you. I thank you that even now the wealth of the wicked is being laid up for the just so that we can build your kingdom. And God, we just thank you that right now you're softening the hearts and minds of people in our city and also around the world 
And I thank you that we'll see um, a great harvest, like easy harvest, like, like easy harvest, like fish kind of like jumping in the boat. I'm talking about like people just getting on the ark. I thank you, Father, that right now is our time. And with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here today, I want to give you an opportunity to accept Jesus because the secret to spiritual growth, it starts with a relationship with Jesus that you have for yourself. You're not saved because you're a good person, and you're not saved because you go to church and do good things. The Bible calls your good works filthy rags. God doesn't want you just to do good things. He wants you to receive his righteousness. And the only way that you can be made righteous is not by you doing righteous acts. It's by you receiving righteousness from Jesus. Long story short, God put his son on a cross for you not to make you do what he wants you to do, but to give you an opportunity to do things his way. And with every head bowed and every eye closed and those who are watching online, if you're here today and you can admit that you've ever sinned, we've all sinned, we've all fallen short of the glory of God, so we are all in need of a savior and his name is Jesus. I'm not offering religion today, but if you want a relationship with your creator, I want to, I, there's a five second prayer that I would love to pray with you. You don't have to be a perfect person to be a forgiven one, but you do need to surrender. And if that bears witness with your spirit, and you say, Pastor, I would like for you to pray with me. I would love to, but I need to know who that is. And so on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to lift your hand just as a sign of saying, hey, Pastor, pray with me. And then you can put it down. All over the building and online, if that's you, today's your day. Don't let the devil steal it from you. You say, Pastor, I want to accept Jesus. I want a relationship with God. I want to be forgiven of my sins. If that's you, on the count of three, lift up your hand. One, two, three. Lift it up bold and high. All over the building right now. Lift it up bold. Say, yeah, God, that's me. Yeah, God, here I am. Thank you. I see your hand. 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 Those of you all online, you can lift your hand right where you are. I believe God sees that. And the Bible says this, the day, thank you. I see your hand. Anybody else? It's not too late. I even hear this, if you want to rededicate your life to the Lord, maybe you've prayed this prayer before, but now you need to recommit back to God going into this new year. There needs to be a new you. Make new decisions. If that's you, please lift up your hand. You say, I want to rededicate my life back to the Lord. I haven't been living fully for him, but I want him today. Thank God. I see your hand, your hand, your hand, your hand, your hand. Anyone else? I want to rededicate my life to the Lord. Anyone else? Okay. And line, if that's you, just put in the chat. I want to be saved. I want to rededicate my life to the Lord. Revival is here. Revival is now. Let's pray this prayer together. Nobody prays alone. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart today. Forgive me of my sins. I want a relationship with you. I believe that you died with me on your mind. I accept you today as my Lord and as my Savior. Lord Jesus, help me put you first for the rest of my life. I am saved. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Come on, church. Y'all excited about that? Hey, today's message is one that you have to share. Today's message will save somebody their church hopping experience. So today's message. Hello? save somebody's marriage it's going to save somebody something make sure you share this with somebody and if you're here today and you're like pastor and i want to be a part of a live church your next step would be growth track and i know some of you guys you've been hearing about growth track but maybe you haven't stepped into it yet my hope is that you would make that step on this side of the new year god has big things that he wants to do with you next year but it's going to require some big faith and so 10 minutes after every service, we have growth track. And actually, today is step number one. If you say, Pastor Ken, I want to learn more about this church. I want to get involved in this church. I want to find a place to serve in this church. Um, all of those things, growth track is actually your next step. And I would actually ask the people of our church, start going through growth track with people. You want to help people grow spiritually? Just don't lead them in a, a prayer of salvation. Go sit through growth track with them. Help them find a team. Help them get on a group. Help them lead a group whenever we do that in 2023. And so my hope for you today is that you'll take that step, the growth track, step number one, get connected, discover purpose, make a difference, and um, I'm going to come over there and say hello to you as well, okay? Um, give it up for Leslie. Here she comes, and I love you guys. We'll see you next week. Thank you so much for tuning in to Alive Online today. 
Hey, if this message blessed you, I just encourage you to share it with a friend because we believe at a live church that one invite can change a life. And if you want to keep in contact with us and know what's going on, be the first to know about it, make sure you click on our subscribe button so that you can keep up with all of our latest content. And hey guys, if you love our church and just want to be a blessing and help support the ministry, you can give at mylivechurch.org give. We love you guys and we'll see you next time.